And we're on. All right, we are reconvening our hearing and continuing to hear from Planning Commission members with Farley Brown from Craftsbury. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I have a few notes here, so I'm just going to have follow my notes, and but feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions along the way. So yeah, my name is Farley Brown. I chair the um, Crassbury Planning Commission. I have for now about eight years been chairing it. I've been serving on it for close to 20 years. I also serve on the Conservation Commission in town. I am the town representative to the MVDA Board of Directors, and I also serve on the MVDA Executive Committee as well. Um, I also teach at Sterling College, so thanks to all the representatives who have taking the time to speak to my stu students who come in and, and bug you all regarding different bills. Um, I teach environmental or uh, ecological courses like um, watershed analysis, uh, wildlife conservation, and I also teach land use planning and environmental law, as I said. But today here I am talking about Crassberry and, um, and really just sharing our land use planning experience as a small town. So Crassbury is what we consider, I imagine, a one acre town. We have no zoning, uh, no subdivision regulations, no wastewater treatment or wastewater or um, sewer or water treatment. Um, but we do have a really dedicated group of people on the planning commission, a nine member board. Um, and all of us have been working really hard with the between the Planning Commission and Conservation Commission to really protect uh, Crassberry's beauty, working landscape, and basically just the vitality of Crassberry as a whole. Uh, there are 55 towns in the Northeast Kingdom, and we're one of 13 uh, that does not have, we don't have zoning. So just real quick, a glimpse at Crassberry, and then I'll get a little bit more into the planning. Um, so we're on the fringes of the Northeast Kingdom. Lots of people like to think that Crassberry is in the Northeast Kingdom. I always say we're not the real Northeast Kingdom, but so we're on the fringes. We have just a um, little bit over 1,300 people in town. Um, and we saw some significant growth in our population between 2018 and 2020. Um, yes, yeah, so 13% was significant for us. We have a thriving economy here, um, thanks to the Crassberry Outdoor Center, Sterling College, as well as a really strong farming community. Um, several of our dairy farms have sold out, but we do have a few that are still operating. <clears throat> Excuse me, and one is milking the smallest, I think is 80 cows, and the largest is about 400 head. Um, we also have some beef farms, a lot of the dairy farms that have sold their cows are now raising beef. Uh, and then we have vegetable farming in Grassberry. We have uh, Pete's Greens, but I'll also have a lot of smaller vegetable farms happening. And two wonderful, three wonderful farm stands. We also have the Moffat uh, Christmas tree farm in Grassberry. And then we have lots of landowners who are um, forest landowners who are um, actually making syrup. So as I keep saying, we don't have zoning or subdivision regs. Um, but we do have floodplain zoning bylaws, which really allows for the town to participate in the flood assistance program and allows our community or our landowners to be able to get flood insurance. Um, there has been a real resistance to land use regulations in Crassbury, um, mostly over the concerns about property rights uh, being infringed upon by local regulations. There's also, though, a concern about the cost of local regulations. We have one town clerk, um, I not even a half-time town clerk, and the town clerk said to me, she's like, I don't even know how we'd even go about administering um, rules if we had them on the books. So uh, definitely costs associated with um, administering uh, land use rules is a challenge, but I do think that property rights is a big one as well. I moved into Crassbury in the early 80s, um, left for a while to go to grad school, came back, and somebody in town told me that we had something far better than zoning. We had community pride, and community pride was going to save us from land development. That was 30 plus years ago, and we have definitely seen a lot of land use change in town. Um, we rely, the select board and the planning commission rely on a variety of other types of planning tools, such as um, incentives, and then also really getting the public involved and, and listening <laughs> to the people. 
um, two thirds of our working landscapes in current use. And uh, we have 5,000 acres that have conservation easements on them. That's approximately 19% of the town base. And then we our act, uh, conservation commission is really active. We've raised about thirty thousand dollars in a conservation fund for to go towards future conservation efforts. We have three village designated centers: um, Crassberry Common, Crassberry Village, and East Crassberry. And so, Crassberry Common Village um, hosts the Crassberry Academy as well as Sterling College. East Crassberry um, hosts the Community Care Center, Crassberry Community Care Center, which is a residential um, assisted living facility with 24 beds. And then Crassberry Village, um, which has our post office, our town hall, the elementary school, and also an auto mechanic and two villages, two village stores, excuse me. Um, the Planning Commission has held several public meetings over the past um, couple of years. One most recently, we developed a village improvement or a village master plan to address um, pedestrian safety and parking issues in Crassberry Village. And so we came up with a variety of different um, uh, recommendations with the help of, of some um, consultants. And so that's all now in the hands of the select board. And we are now currently updating the town plan. We rely heavily on the municipal planning grants that are available. Um, and we work so closely with MVDA. I, I don't know what we do without Allison Lowe over at MVDA and helping us to write our town plan. So we're very, very connected to um, MVDA and to our regional planning commission. We have relied a lot on public input in the development of our town plans. Um, it was great back in 2006, we had over 50% people um, of the residents responding to our town survey, 40% in 2015. Uh, last fall, unfortunately, we only had 19% return. I keep saying to folks, especially folks who are pushing back around uh, property rights and don't tell me what to do, I keep saying, you know, the, the world is run by those who show up. And so a lot of the volunteers here, um, you know, are we're speaking for a diverse sector or a lot of people on our planning commission come from a different corners of the town. And so we're really, um, we just feel very strongly that there needs to be a real diverse um, voices um, around the table. We're, the most recent update of the town plan is focusing a lot on Act 171. And this has been a great opportunity for us to think about those contiguous forested blocks, those habitat connectivity blocks, and recognition that our town is predominantly conserved either through current use, which is not in perpetuity, but also in conservation easements. So documenting those critical forested blocks and habitat connectivity has been critical, um, is also critical for our town plan, a reflection of of what our town is um, basically known for in terms of its rural characteristics. We had one um, public walk so far in the an area that's designated as a, a contiguous forest block. Uh, unfortunately, it was pouring rain, so we only had 16 people come out. Uh, we are gonna be hosting next month a community values mapping um, workshop, which has been part of what Jens Helke and, and folks over at Fish and Wildlife have been encouraging for folks to do around the state. So we're gonna be having, uh, getting residents out to, to speak to their values regarding uh, the working landscape, recreation, hunting and fishing, historic areas are really important here in town, natural areas, scenic areas as well. And then of course the community hubs or community spaces that are important. Um, I think personally that Act 171 strengthens our town plan, and I really hope that it's going to encourage landowners or residents to think beyond our own little um, uh, private property. So, um, yeah, our plan, our landscape here in Crassberry really um, hosts a variety of uh, flora and fauna. We've had some bio blitzes in town. It's just been spectacular to document our natural heritage or natural communities. We have. Um, Let's see, let me think about this. Um, there are really, without having um, zoning or subdivision rules, there's really little 
very few ways for us to document how the town is actually, or where development is going, how the town is growing. And um, some of the developments way out there in the open, it's very visible and we can see, but a lot of the growth that's happening is happening in forested areas that we don't see um, exactly where those driveways or where those areas are. We had a, a select board member some years ago used to sit in the village and he'd watch for the pool and lumber truck to come into town and he'd follow the truck to go find out where the delivery was being made and who was developing what. And so, but we don't have that anymore. So um, we don't <laughs> know where the development's happening, which is a shame um, in many ways. So um, I think that um, it's well, a logical growth center would be Crassberry Village because that's where we have um, stores and uh, resources, our post office, as I said, there's walkability happening in the village. But we have major natural resource constraints in the Crassberry Village. We're in the um, river floodplain or, or excuse me, river quarter of the Black River on one side. And then on the other side where it's all wetlands and floodplain. So um, we're really struggling in Crassberry Village. Uh, again, if that were to be targeted as a planned growth center, um, we would have to find some creative ways and lots of money to figure out how to actually have that as a growth center. Um, so that's a big challenge we have here in town. Uh, I mentioned that we don't have um, sewer and water systems, though there is a small uh, municipal water system up here in Crassbury Common that services four, 40 different homes, Sterling College and Crassbury Academy. For the past two years, we've been on a no drink order here um, in Crassbury Common because of PFAS um, contamination in our wells. So two over two years now. Um, fortunately, we finally just had a well drilled that is producing a lot of great clean water. So hopefully by the end of next summer or this coming summer, we'll be back on, um, we'll be off the no drink order. Thankfully for the state, we have bottled water for, for all the residents here. I guess I'm, I'm sharing all these different pieces just to say that as a town that doesn't have any local zoning or um, subdivision rules, regulations in place, Act 250 is not, um, I don't know of a lot of Act 250 projects that are have happened recently here in town. Um, we do struggle with not knowing enough about what's happening or having limited oversight of development in Crassberry. Um, I personally, at the little bit I've read of this of H687, I personally support the um, the changes to Act 250. I'm old enough to have been at least not here, but at least knowledgeable or around in the 80s when Act 250 and Act 200 were really rolling. I recognize that Act 250, the intent of the original law was never carried out. So some of these changes might actually help us to, mm -hmm. to, really, to realize the Act 250 the way it was intended so many decades ago. But I'm not an expert when it comes to Act 250. Um, I'm really curious about the jurisdictional tiers and how Crassberry, how those would, um, uh, how Crassberry would fit into those tiers, a tier system. Um, but I am really in favor of the road rule, the forest blocks, um, planned growth areas, and then really just the language around climate resilience and mitigation. That's right. Crassberry. Thank you for your testimony and um, for all your work in, in Craftsbury and the many hats you're wearing. Um, mm -hmm. It's always great to see your students in the building. So oh, thanks. <laughs> great to have them here. And as a side note, I was up in your neck of the woods this weekend and went to the went to the Blackbird Bistro. Ah. Craftsbury. <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful resource. Yeah. My husband always says, let's go hit the bars in Craftsbury. I'm like, we have no bars, but there is the bistro. That has a little <laughs> great. Do members have questions? No, thank you. That was yeah, helpful. thank you. Um, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank yeah, you. and give a shout if you have any other questions. Um, and I do have, um, and I want to just 
I want to give folks a second to think. So yeah, go ahead, Representative okay, Tori. Thank you. I'm just curious about the community care center that you mentioned and how that started in Craftsbury. Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, well, it goes way back to the, the 90s when there was the, originally the Brass Knocker Farm. That was a one of VLT's very first big projects, conservation project. And with the preservation or cons conservation of that land around the farm, there was a section of land set off to the side to do some form of, um, I want to th think that was tied into that, but some type of a, um, facility for um, our elder, for older folks in town. And so uh, there was a group of folks, specifically Carol Maroney, who was really instrumental in getting that up and going. And we are predominant, we're usually at full capacity at 24 beds. Um, it's a fantastic resource in part. Um, one of the greatest situations now is that across the street in the East Pres um, Presbyterian Church, there is the elementary no, excuse me, it's a daycare center. And so they spend a lot of time over at the community care center. Well, thank you. Um, it's great. Do you, know, are, do you all know the source of the, the PFAS contamination in your well? Um, there are, no, we don't. We'll just leave it at that. There are test um, wells or little, little spots that they've put out to uh, try to determine the source of contamination. Um, it's tricky because the the Sterling Boys School and um, Sterling College, our leach field is somewhat near that well, but um, the well was put into place. Um, it's 500 feet deep. Everyone, when it was put into place, everyone's like, oh, there's not going to be a problem. Um, we don't know. I mean, there's a problem, PFAS, but we don't know the source. And it, I don't know if it's linked to the Sterling um, septic system or leach field, but hope we'll find out soon, I hope. Great, uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, do you have any idea uh, when you had your well tested, how many parts per trillion it, there were involved? Mm -hmm. We were 20 part, 22 parts per trillion. Um, one of the immediate solutions was to blend the contaminated well with the backup well, which is on my property and the backup well is clean. And we blended the two and we brought it down to, I think it, the lowest it got to was maybe um, 11 parts per trillion, but it fluctuated up and down. And then the clean well, the backup well, um, was running out of water this summer. So, well, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but are the federal standards 70 parts per trillion? Um, yes, but the EPA has most recently come out with a way lower um uh, percentage and I can't remember what that is, but it's um, seventy parts per trillion is a very common stem level that's held by all the states or by many states as well, and well, it was EPA. Were you mandated to drill another well? Yes. By whom? Uh, by the state. Yes. Yeah. So we had to. There was there was no way that we could afford to put. Um, any type of filtration system, even if it exists um, for on our municipal water system. So we definitely had to drill. They came out onto my property, went 800 feet and hit maybe two gallons per minute. They went off to another parcel, um, drilled another 800 feet and hit, I think at that point was 13 parts per uh, um, um, gallons per minute. And they finally went over to Sterling College property and they went 500 feet and it's just gushing at, I think, like 30 per, um, gallons per minute. It's beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank you for joining us today uh, Great. And, and for your testimony. Great. Thank you. So with that, is Ryan Bozo? Yep. Oh, yeah. Hi. Sometimes I can't see who's in this. A bad spot there. Great. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me, giving me the chance to speak today. Um, I'm Dr. Ron Rebozo. I'm the Director of Conservation Science with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. We're an ecological nonprofit. We're based in White River Junction, and we conduct research on Vermont's rare species, their habitats, and biodiversity in general. Um, we pride ourselves in conducting applied research that can help inform decision makers like yourselves decide on how to best protect our biodiversity moving forward. Um, 
I think, you know, we have several projects, but one that um, ties in well with this idea of protecting biodiversity and having a good sense of what our biodiversity is, is our Vermont Atlas of Life. And that is a big data repository of all things biodiversity in Vermont. Um, everything from our largest mammals down to things like fungi and moss and everything in between. Um, so we incorporate records from museums, herbariums, research projects, community scientists, and have amassed this database of over 9 million records. And that allows us to do a few things. One is paint the best picture we have so far on biodiversity in the state and where it's distributed. It allows us to get a good sense of trends over time. And it also allows us with our in-house expertise to model how this might change in the future, right? How our composition of species and their distribution might change over time. I say all that to give you a little bit of a background as to our expertise and kind of where we fit into this discussion of what biodiversity we actually have in the state and how best to protect. Um, so when given the chance to, to speak on something like a critical resource area in the context of a bill that's aimed at protecting our um, resilient natural communities and biodiversity, um, I start off by thinking, how good of a job are we doing now? And there's a couple points that stood out to me in our organizations in that Vermont Atlas of Life tenure report, which I'm happy to share with anybody here. Um, but a couple of things that stood out to me that tell part of this story is that Vermont is roughly about 25% conserved. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on that and, and, and efforts to improve that. Um, but of that 25% functionally, uh, we estimate about 13% of species ranges or their distributions are actually protected, right? So it's, it's uh, not that 25% that isn't necessarily um, evenly distributed. Um, we expect that as we model how these distributions might change in the future, that that 13% is likely to go down to closer to about 11%. Um, you know, my initial thought when seeing that was that, well, maybe our conserved lands are geared towards protecting our rare species. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case, right? It seems to be that our rare species are, are being uh, conserved at about that 13% level as well. Um, Another thing that stood out to me is that private lands are actually um, protecting a greater percentage of our species distributions um, than our conserved public lands. Um, this just kind of highlights the value of, of getting creative and how we fit private lands into this discussion about diversity protection going forward. Um, and as you might expect that- I, I'm sorry, I wanna make sure I captured that last thought you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, private lands are conserving what percentage? A greater percentage Percent. in our public lands uh, in terms of our species distribution. And not necessarily conserve private lands. Correct. Just private versus public. Exactly. Um, and as you might expect, uh, the trend uh, will suggest that um, things aren't likely to improve on their own, right? Um, you know, after decades of forest recovery, we're uh, averaging about, two, I believe it's 12,500 acres of forest loss a year in Vermont. Um, and by 2100, our modeling suggests that we might lose about 6% of our biodiversity or over 380 species. And that's a net loss, right? So that's accounting for species we expect might move in as our climate warms and is more uh, conducive to their presence. Um, so, sorry, by when? Uh, 2100, so the end of the, end, end of the century. Um, it's just a convenient number for a lot of our, our, our model projects. Uh, but um, so I, I, I kind of say all that to paint the picture and, and suggest that um, our conserved lands are, you know, are a significant portion of our state, but they might not be protecting our biodiversity as well as we might have expected as they're currently configured. And um, private lands play a big role in this as well, right? So again, kind of lending some credibility to this idea that, you know, there can be interesting and innovative ways that we can think about biodiversity protections happening on private lands in addition to public lands. You have um, a question for Representative Smith. Yes, good. What do you anticipate losing by 2100? Um, it's going to be a mix uh, across all taxa, so all groups of organisms, but the largest group that stands out are insects. Um, and, you know, again, we're talking about a 75-year time frame. A lot of losses when it comes to biodiversity, there's going to be some lag time involved, right? Um, we know insects play kind of an in important role in our food webs. So if we're losing them in the next few decades, it's likely that we can have additional losses in decades past. Um, but but to your point, it's it's primarily insect species at this point. White flies and mosquitoes. <laughs> I can't say for sure, but they might be in that mix as well. It would be a shame to lose them, as as bad as I hate to say that, because they're a source of feed for a lot of birds and bats. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, kind of a double-edged sword there, but right. thank you. Um, so, in thinking along the lines of um, 
you know, critical resource areas, you know, often when we use critical, it's to suggest something that um, has a disproportional impact. Um, I think the state uses that, or I think our agency of ag uses that for critical source areas. So when they think of an area that has a disproportional impact on pollution. Um, and I think that's maybe a good way to think of critical resource areas too, areas that might have a disproportional impact on our biodiversity. Um, so a few things come to mind for me, and I think um, the bill, as I understand it, addresses some of these. Um, one would be areas that provide significant ecosystem services and that are sensitive or likely to be negative impacted by poorly planned development or land use. Um, things like, again, prime agricultural soils, we know the services they provide and are worth protecting. Things like steep slopes and shallow soils, they're likely to be eroded and difficult to build those soils back up. Um, our wetlands for their services that they provide being um, you know, just the habitat feature that they are, but also the, the role that they play in, in, in flooding. Um, another thing that I think could, could play into this kind of same theme as well would be soils that haven't had a history of disturbance. These tend to be the soils that are more resilient to invasion of plants. And when you have these resilient intact systems, they support biodiversity and um, they're gonna be more likely to, to persist through a lot of the stressors we expect to be happening uh, over the coming decades. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources here and in nearby states aimed at um, improving degraded habitat and for good reason, but I think it's also important to, to prioritize places that are intact and functioning now um, so that we don't necessarily have to commit resources to, to improving them as well. Now you just to pause on undisturbed soils. Sure. And where, where would we find those? How would we find them? Yeah, I think a good place to start when I'm thinking of other places that have done this is, is taking a look at areas that were forested in our earliest aerial imagery. Um, back, you know, when, when, when planes were taking photos, um, those, that would be a good place to start in lack of, of other more definitive sources of areas that haven't been to. Um, so another kind of um, idea that I have when I'm thinking along the lines of critical resource areas are, of course, areas that are currently supporting unique assemblages of species, right, kind of a, a unique biodiversity uh, composition. Um, again, this is one of the, the products of that, that 10 year report that we put out that I mentioned, which highlights areas in the state that really light up uh, as, as kind of being these unique harbors of, of community. Um, that way we can, you know, maybe, maybe focus some of the efforts in areas which are kind of highlighted for protections and, and have, uh, you know, a little more bang for our buck in that specificity. Um, to me, I think this complements what the state does really well with their uh, natural community mapping. Um, and it's maybe just another tool in the toolbox in identifying some of these biodiversity hotspots, right? A term that we usually associate at the global level and incites ideas of uh, coral reefs and, and, and rainforests, but is applicable here right? when we think of areas in our state that are supporting unique uh, suites of species. Um, just as it's important to kind of think about where those places are now, I think there's value in, in, in thinking about where in the future, we might be having these, these hotspots of biodiversity, right? Um, so this has kind of been another product of our, our, our mapping and modeling efforts have been to identify where areas of unique biological communities might exist, again, at the end of the century, um, to complement what we know about our species distributions now. Um, you know, we have the tools now and, and, and they're, they're continue to get refined and improved that allows us to think along those lines where in the past it would have been difficult to predict some of these areas with confidence. Um, one piece to kind of throw in the mix here too is it, it's not just where we are now and where we'll be in 80 years, but it's, um, you know, these changes are gonna happen at different rates. Species are gonna respond to stressors and a changing climate at different rates and they'll move around our landscape differently as well. So um, part of this might be identifying areas that are gonna function as refugia that might not have species composition turnover as fast as other spots. Um, and again, this was another interest of ours and, and part of our modeling efforts as well. Um, the last thing I'll hit on, and I think the bill mentions this quite a bit, is habitat connectors and connectivity. And of course, when we're thinking about having this transition of protecting our biodiversity today and tomorrow, can, making sure that that's just happened at, in the connectivity so things can move across the landscape effectively um, is going to be an important piece of this as well. Um, you know, I, I think uh, that kind of ties in these ideas of, of biodiversity hotspots and refugia. And, you know, it, it really ag acknowledges the, uh, the concept that populations are dynamic. Populations are always changing um, and they're always moving, even for non-mobile organisms, right? Plant populations are dynamic as well. So that habitat connectivity piece is an important one. Um, I'll just, you know, start wrapping up by saying, um, you know, we have the benefit now to go back and look at some conservation successes, whether it's in you know, the protections of lands, 
or on the recovery of certain species. Um, and, you know, in, in all of these cases, they've all kind of happened with intent, right? We've had um, recovery plans in place. We put the resources in to learn about these species and come up with a plan of action. I think now with our biodiversity data, we're in a position where we can start doing that, not just at the species level, but looking across our biodiversity across our landscape as well. Um, about a year ago, my organization and a few others, we held a series of webinars geared towards legislators um, on, a, on a series of topics that we thought were relevant. Things like climate change, our forests, biodiversity, and water resources. And we invited a number of, of local experts to testify, uh, or to speak on that rather. And two common themes that came out of that, even though they were different topics and um, experts from, from all different backgrounds, was the idea of um, our diverse systems are more resilient to change. And we expect our habitats and our, and our climate to change uh, pretty significantly in the coming decades, right? A lot of our planning up until this point, I think, has, has functioned under the idea that the future is going to be much like the past. And I think we know that's, that's no longer a safe bet. The other common thread was keeping forests as far as is a, is a major priority for protecting our biodiversity moving forward. Um, so just to quickly recap, um, our conserved lands um, are not necessarily adequately protecting our biodiversity, if, especially if we're thinking about what that might look like in the future. Private lands are going to play an important role, so I lend some support to thinking creatively about how we might incorporate biodiversity protections into the future land use planning of private lands. Um, some important things that come to mind for me when thinking about critical resource areas are, again, sensitive habitats that provide important ecosystem services, our biodiversity hotspots today and where they'll be in the future, and connecting those areas um, to the extent possible. And um, the last piece is just that now more than ever, we, we have uh, data and, and confidence in our models to support some of these long range planning ideas. And, and I think um, it's interesting that this is coming in front of the, co the committee and it's an important topic and I'm glad you all have brought it up. So that's all I have and I'll take some questions. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Fabulia. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, so I, I presume that you've had slides, should presume anything. Have you, are you aware of the uh, work that happened this uh, summer and fall, uh, the necessary changes to Act 250 working group? Uh, not in specifics, no. So that group looked at uh, helping us understand how we might um, map the state, mm -hmm. consider the state in terms of tiers for Act 250 jurisdiction, um, including uh, tier three, which is critical resource areas, which is what I believe you are here testifying uh, about. And that, <clears throat> that report um, recommended uh, that there be more kind of analysis and public engagement mm -hmm. in terms of identifying this. It's, it's pretty significant impact. Do you have any um, thoughts on um, an appropriate um, kind of broad public engagement process looking at critical um, resource areas and, and how we define them? Yeah, I, I think um, I think we have a number of organizations in the state, including state agencies that are taking a, a pretty close look at biodiversity um, in the state currently, right? So we, I think we have a good, I think we have what we need to map these areas and, and hopefully with kind of some collaboration, there's an ability to prioritize which areas are important for protecting now and in the future. Um, you know, I think to the extent that we could include, um, you know, larger data, data sets that like we're talking about the number of records that we have in addition to modeling so that it's not just a, a, a static assessment or, or designation of important areas. It's something that can be dynamic and change over time as our species distributions will change in time. I would hope that would be part of the conversation, but I think there's, there's likely a number of stakeholders that would have um, important inputs into that, that discussion you mentioned. Members have other questions? Um, so I guess I wanna follow up a little bit. So it sounded like you looked at our current definition of critical resource areas mm -hmm. and um, the one suggestion or thing that I caught was these undisturbed soils as mm -hmm. something to include possibly further. Um, did you, did I miss anything? Did you have other thoughts on those? Um, did we, do you suggest adding anything else or? Um, yeah, I think that was that was the big one. And then also, you know, these areas that 
uh, hopefully at a, as a, of a process that we just mentioning can identify hot spots of biodiversity for lack of a better term, these areas that support a unique suite of species. Um, again, with the idea that hopefully it reflects both areas, those areas today and what we have good confidence in. Right. Um, again, I, the idea behind there, in my mind at least, is to kind of focus efforts on a more concentrated area and maybe um, eliminate what would otherwise maybe be more sweeping uh, designations of, of, of critical habitat areas, for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you for your testimony. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Bob Zeno joining us. Good afternoon. Just going to try to looking at the Atlas of Life. It did go full screen. Um, it's just a full second. Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's great to be back here with you all. For the record, my name is Robert Zeno, ecologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about H687 and the critical resource areas. Uh, you're familiar with my work on Vermont conservation design and natural communities. Uh, since uh, Mr. Sorensen retired uh, now, I think two or three years ago, I've been uh, responsible for the Act 250 and Section 248 review of projects uh, related to uh, rare and irreplaceable natural areas, which is typically uh, rare and uncommon natural communities, and also where there's a way to consider it forest fragmentation and habitat connectivity, primarily in section 248, where there's a broader uh, uh, level of, uh, of review there. So I wanted to offer comments with that context, and I know you've heard from uh, Mr. Coster and Mr. Austin, who have provided, I think, some broader agency positions on this, and so just wanted to to reflect that they've they've offered those those positions as well. Before diving into uh, the critical resource area piece of this, I wanted to just really appreciate the fact that you've added criteria related to forest fragmentation and uh, habitat connectivity into uh, this bill. I think that's that's really key to protecting those two ecological functions. Uh, not something that's easily gotten at with Act 250 now. And the addition of those criteria will make uh, the review of those projects and the maintaining of ecological function, I think that much more uh, will make it able and, and efficient. I do have uh, two comments on that. One is that um, the definition of connecting habitat is very broad. Uh, I think it's essentially any habitat that connects one habitat to another, uh, land and water. And I would interpret that as much broader than the uh, highest priority connecting blocks in BCD, for example, in Vermont conservation design. I think it, it really encompasses almost all of our natural land in the state. You're talking about within the forest block criteria, the new criteria that we're talking about? Well, I, I believe it's in the definitions and then it's referred to, I think, both in the criteria and in the critical resource area. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't have a position on whether that's appropriate or not, just noting that it, it's very broad and encompassing as written right now. And when I look at that, oh, please. No, go ahead. When I, when I think about that broad definition in the context of the criterion uh, for habitat connectivity, uh, it seems like it's possible that almost any natural landscape could trigger that uh, criterion. 
And that had me thinking about a comment that, that Mr. Koster made about uh, the current standard related to both forest fragmentation and habitat connectivity criteria is, I believe, avoid and minimize, which is not a, it's not an absolute standard. It's relative to the project as it comes in. A uh, standard like no undue adverse impacts, which is what's used for rare and irreplaceable natural areas right now, would set a, an absolute standard and could be applied to think about the, the overall level of impact in the context of where the project is proposed. So you might have a project proposed in a habitat connector uh, project of X amount of size, and it could have a very minimal impact because of the overall context of the project. And it could be in a different habitat connector, same size project, same configuration, but because of its contextual location could have a very severe impact to ecological function and the way those shake out with avoid and minimize might be very similar. The way they shake out with no undue adverse impact to uh, forest fragmentation or ecological, or excuse me, habitat connectivity might be very different. Are you supporting one over the other? I think that Mr. Com Mr. Coster's suggestion that no undue adverse impact would provide a an absolute standard that applicants would have to meet uh, would be uh, appropriate in this, and it would mirror the language under rare and irreplaceable natural areas. Uh, turning to critical resource areas, as they're currently defined, you know this, but it's river corridors, significant wetlands, steep slopes, shallow to bedrock areas, prime agricultural soils, and uh, connecting habitat. I just wanted to briefly go through some of those and uh, offer some perspective on uh, what they provide in terms of uh, what they offer as critical resources, uh, but also some of the challenges of applying them. And I'll, I'll just go through them uh, relatively quickly. And starting with river corridors and riparian areas, and I know that uh, my colleagues have offered some higher level agency positions on this. So I'm not making a recommendation here, but I wanted to show the very different mapping and implications that come out of what's chosen to represent this resource. So on the screen here, I have uh, the river corridor mapping, which is this light blue color. And I have the Vermont Conservation Design highest priority surface waters and riparian areas in dark blue. And the river corridor, which is uh, designed and mapped to focus, as I understand it, primarily on geomorphic function, uh, which is critical for rivers, uh, but it, it occupies this relatively narrow space. And Vermont Conservation Design, which is integrating uh, a number of ecological functions in, a diff in addition to just river geomorphology, occupies a much larger area. <clears throat> and I think that's a consistent pattern that you'll see across the state. Again, I'm not making a recommendation here, but I wanna point out these two different uh, mapping sources and show that they have very different uh, ecological uh, and regulatory implications. I don't have a slide about wetlands, but I'll just uh, say, and I think other witnesses have, have spoken to this, that the Vermont wetland rules are very comprehensive. They encompass a number of or a wide range of ecological functions, including fish and wildlife habitat, rare species, and significant natural communities. All that's baked into the wetland permit review process. And so there's a lot of uh, protection already afforded through the wetland rules to those features. Can, can we just rewind or stay on sure. East Middlebury, where I live, um, and, and note that uh, our, our definition of critical resource area don't think relies on surface waters and riparian areas, so. No, I, okay. I appreciate that and understand that. I'm just showing uh, the difference in mapping here and the, the implications of, of what each of those is and might mean. Okay. Go ahead. What is the takeaway, Mr. What is it you want us to take away from this slide? So I, I believe that you've had others testify that the Vermont Conservation Design Surface Waters and Riparian Areas might be an appropriate tool to use instead of river corridors. Might be an appropriate tool to use. I believe you've had testimony to that effect. 
And so I want to point out that if you were to consider that, that you're considering a very different framework than the river corridors. Got it. Thank so, you. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. That's okay. And uh, I mean, big picture, this gets to the way these are chosen is going to have big implications. You know this, but I mean, these, these will have term implications and the, uh, the ecological functions that are maintained or protected by these. Uh, can, can you help us understand why this is mapped as surface waters and riparian areas in Vermont conservation design? Yes, Vermont Conservation Design is looking at uh, not just the river process now, what the river needs for its geomorphic stability, but the overall geologic uh, setting that is the river valley, the river, uh, the valley bottom area, which is defined by a combination of slope, where you have slope breaks, the accumulation of water across the landscape, and some other uh, modeling that, uh, forgive me, I don't remember all the details of. Being quite familiar with this particular neck of the woods, I'll say, those are the maps of the alluvial soils. <laughs> like, uh, I, and there's a gravel pit under one of them, and that helps us all understand, because um, as a Middlebury Planning or Conservation Commission member, we've also been looking at this as well. So. Okay, great. Here's a map, an example map of steep slopes. And these are areas that often uh, uh, intersect areas of high ecological importance, like rare natural communities. Sometimes uh, steep slopes uh, will have rare natural communities, but not always. Uh, there are also places that are largely self-protecting. Uh, they're often naturally limiting of development, and they're places that are, are often conserved at a higher rate to begin with. And just, just wanted to point that out. There are also, the mapping of steep slopes gets very complex, as you can see here. So everything that's yellow and more red is greater than 15%, which I believe is the threshold currently in the critical resource area. And I know that FPR in their reserve forest land, which uses steep slopes as one of their criteria, in that, uh, in the reserve forest land category, had to deal with some issues around mapping and how to take this spaghetti and turn it into a uh, a meaningful set of units. As it, as I think I read it now, you have jurisdiction in yellow. You would have Act Two Fifty jurisdiction in yellow, but not in green. And from my point of view, I think sometimes that might be ecologically meaningful, and other times it might not. Yeah. I mean, one challenge is, and we just heard from planning commission member in a very steep town that they are regulating steep slopes for the very reasons that this is a both human and natural community bill. Like the developments that happen on those steep slopes need to be done very sensitively. But I hear you. I guess I was also gonna use the steep slopes to get to a broader question about any of these resources. And it's, uh, if they're triggers, is the jurisdiction established by the mapping or is it established by what's on the ground? And so I work with this all the time with natural communities. And it also applies to things like wetlands and deer wintering areas. When there's already jurisdiction, we go out and we find what's on the ground and what's on the ground is what's actually uh, of concern. So the deer wintering area or the natural community could be mapped, however, in our databases, but we go out on the ground and we assess what's actually there. And that's what we focus on. And that's very easy when you're already into the process. That seems like it would be something that's very hard for an applicant who's trying to work with uh, mapping that may not be precise. Although, I mean, I'm, do you work with the wetlands program? Because they do that now. We map them and we go out and field check them. We kind of do this all the time now. Right, I guess wetlands with their permit process, yes. <clears throat> so I'm not exactly clear on the difference there. But I mean, I get your point. It's on a map. You're not totally sure it's on the ground. So you need to go ground truth it. 
right? I guess I was thinking about it in terms of, of that, but also something like a habitat block and trying to figure out where you're in or out of it, which is, is something I was going to get to here in just a second. So I mentioned the, the definition of connecting habitat. Uh, here's Vermont Conservation Design with the uh, the blue is the highest priority connectivity blocks, and the green is all of the other Vermont Conservation Design for highest priority forest blocks, so the interior forest and the geological diversity blocks. I, I don't think that using Vermont Conservation Design broadly or even narrowed down to just the highest priority uh, connectivity blocks really makes for a good jurisdictional trigger. Uh, it's not, it certainly wasn't the intent we had when we created Vermont Conservation Design, as I think you've heard many times. And there's a whole range of strategies that can conserve ecological function. One of the things that I think about a lot is that landowners are often really excited to hear about how their property fits into Vermont Conservation Design, how they're contributing by stewarding their property to long-term ecological function. And I really worry about the idea that landowners who are pursuing good stewardship, who are interested in the ideas of landscape scale ecology and, and the Vermont conservation design, to take that and now it suddenly becomes not, oh, you're doing this great thing, you're contributing to the vision in Vermont conservation design, but you're in Vermont conservation design, you are now subject to Act 250. That seems like uh, a real way to, to kill the excitement around uh, what they could contribute to Vermont conservation design. So I have a question. So we, we refer to it as connecting habitat, and we have taken testimony that there are particular pinch points that are, that are critical, that if we lose them, we lose them. Right. And would your office be prepared to help regional planning commissions and towns map those? Yes. But we didn't refer to blocks actually in our definition. Right, it's not in there, but it's unclear what it uh, what exactly it refers to. And I know it's been interpreted by some people as being Vermont Conservation Design highest priority. There's to, some assumptions made. Yeah. I think that's so I'm I'm trying to be clear about what I'm how I'm interpreting this. So no, I don't all of what I was saying about it, I don't think it being a good trigger is that I don't think whatever I don't think that that's a good fit to take connecting habitat and link it to those highest priority blocks. I think we could drill down and get more refined with Vermont conservation design, but I'm not sure that's going to be as easy as it, like in concept. It, it sounds really simple to me. We find the places like Shootsville Hill or this spot in Brandon that I've marked with the red arrow where you have these pinch points, the connectivity is narrowed down. And if you lose that, you lose the network, but it, the limits of that get fuzzy to me really quickly. And this red arrow is part of this much broader connection between the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains shown in that yellow line. And all of that is critical too, but the area starts increasing rapidly. And then you start thinking about, well, we're connecting the Adirondacks to the green so that we can connect the Adirondacks up to the Northeast Kingdom, which is through Shootsville and the Worcester Range. And pretty quick, you're back at the whole Vermont conservation design network. So I think it would take some time and, and real thinking to focus in on what those areas are. We, we could probably get to some of the really key spots, but I think it's, it's going to take more time and thought than, uh, than I, I think I originally thought. I thought this might be a relatively simple exercise of finding a you know, dozen places, but I think it's going to be more than that to really figure out at what scale and how to delimit those areas. And then this is why I brought up these questions about uh, the mapping and jurisdiction, because as you know, we've updated our habitat block mapping. So here's, uh, this is I think Mount Philo and Charlotte. And this is the original habitat block mapping using uh, land cover data from 2006. And so here's what we've updated that to now. So if, if the connecting habitat critical 
source area was to use habitat blocks. Uh, we've already gone through one update of the mapping with some pretty significant changes. And you can see here where these arrows are. <clears throat> and then what it looks like now. And so if this was jurisdictional, that would be a big change uh, in those places. I think about the way that we updated Vermont conservation design over the past two years with a team of experts, scientists, and uh, other agency and partner staff who really contributed to making this a science-based uh, product. And I think about how, how that would have been a very different process if our work mapping habitat blocks translated directly into uh, now this is where there will or will not be Act 250 jurisdiction. I think it would be a very different process. I really wanted to suggest other features as critical resource areas, because things like nat rare, and, uh, excuse me, rare and uncommon natural communities, old forests, uh, some important wildlife habitats, rare species, all of those are, they are critical resources and they're essential for maintaining an ecologically functional landscape. But I think, again, these all have some challenges too. And some of them are dynamic, rare species move around the landscape. Uh, we have inconsistent mapping of many of these features, including the natural communities that I'm responsible for mapping. Uh, we're constantly working to update that and improve it. And then there's this issue that I, when I'm doing my natural community inventory work, uh, I'm going out and I'm, I'm reaching out to private landowners and I'm looking for features on their land to provide them assistance that hopefully they can take what I learn about their place and use it to steward it well into the future. And I, I really hope that it stays that positive vision rather than being, uh, you know, to me being like a walking Act 250 jurisdiction uh, by finding a natural community. Uh, I don't mean to be flipped. I, I'm, uh, I think there's a real concern about, we've, we've made, I think, huge progress in encouraging landowners to contribute to this ecologically functional landscape uh, through these positive interactions. And I'd hate to see that lost uh, and for uh, features to be, or that work to be seen as uh, negative. I realize I've, I've not offered a lot of, uh, I've offered a lot of complexity and not a lot of uh, solutions here. And I, yes. <laughs> part of that is, I, I think it just is challenging and, uh, I think that the agency's position has been that there needs to be time to sort this out. And I think that the issues that I'm raising are not necessarily insurmountable, but I think that time would be of good use to really think through how the features are going to be considered in the critical resource area component, uh, what they'll be, and then how they'll be interpreted. So uh, I think that would be that building in that space would be valuable. I want to just end, I guess, with a uh, reflection. Mr. Koster spoke about the way that agency staff spend time reviewing these projects, Act 250 projects. And I guess I just wanted to offer my personal experience with that. And I've, even though I've only been doing this for two years or so, I've already had uh, contested Act 250 cases, contested Section 248 projects. Uh, so I think I've gotten a pretty good window into it. And I'm chugging along doing my uh, natural community inventory, hopefully spending a lot of time out in the woods in the summer and working on Vermont conservation design, working on Act 59, uh, all exciting stuff. And then I have this unpredictable and irregular arrival of projects that come in for review. And I don't know when they're gonna come in, uh, what they're gonna entail. And so they're, they're taking time to review and that's, I want to do a good job reviewing those. I want to be, uh, you know, consider the deadlines, be respectful of the applicants who are uh, wanting timely information. And that's time that then gets taken away uh, unpredictably from all that other work that I'm doing. And just to, to offer that that's, 
that's just an ongoing challenge and, and uh, it's very real. Uh, I think I had two more maps, but they're sort of incidental to the, the points that I'm making. Uh, so I think I'll end there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks for testifying. Representative Bob. Maybe just to go back to the chairs, comparison to Redlands that came out, steep slopes, for instance, where it was the aerial photos and then everything was automatically class two unless it got moved up or down, but which in the old days to the board, water resources board. Um, we have to start somewhere. Um, like you're saying, don't use for lots conservation design. Here are the reasons you're saying, um, and, and yet we have to figure out uh, how we identify um, these rare and irreplaceable natural areas and, um, and a couple of and the other things we're trying to protect here. So, any thoughts about I, I know you've said kind of just give it a lot of time, but kind of to what end and how do, how do you see that actually possibly unfolding? Not so much that, it's how do we, what, do, what would be your suggestions about how we identify those areas? And it seems to me that slope maps actually a good place to start and maybe check it on the ground, the same way you do with wetlands. So, and so any, any reaction to what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I guess uh, I agree. It's not insurmountable, but uh, it's like figuring out how to get there without uh, without losing a lot of the uh, support and uh, positive aspects that we get from having these as non-regulatory tools right now, and. Maybe it's beyond my scope to picture exactly what that process is, but it, it seems like doing it uh, through a, a process where everyone who's involved has a lot of time to think and consider how these features are going to be incorporated is likely to pay off in the long run more so than uh, a quick decision that then uh, doesn't allow for that reflection consideration. All right. Thanks again for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, members, we'll take a five-minute break. We have a few more witnesses to hear from this afternoon. Thanks, Robert. 